Today, we are talking about right. how light interacts with minerals to create stunning energy. One of my favorite topics, and Jim was telling me that apparently people have actually complained that I don't talk enough about this, so we decided to sit down and talk about it. So most people, particularly in the health and wellness space, have historically been much too focused on matter, supplements, nutrients, elements. Believe me, we love our material uh, things, our supplements and supplements and minerals and vitamins and all the rest of it. But unfortunately, the energy side of the equation, because if you look at Einstein's general relativity, it's E equals MC squared. The energy side of the equation and the light piece of the puzzle really gets forgotten, mm -hmm. which is why, you know, the most stunning testimonials I get, the most amazing results I see are not people who just take or do or try mineral balancing or nutritional balancing or take supplements of any kind. <clears throat> they actually fix their lighting environment as well. And I think this is a huge misconception in the alternative integrative health world, as well as an area where most people sadly are completely out of their depth, you know, and I, I just see people making all of these incredible mistakes and then not even realizing it, which is why we spend a lot of time talking about light in addition to talking about minerals. Mm. But when it comes down to how these two things work together in order to create energy, you have to understand the fundamental premise of the foundations of energy generation in the cell, which is that, and this is something that most biochemists, biologists, doctors, scientists don't understand and don't appreciate because they've never read Gerald Pollack's work. They've never read any of Gilbert Ling's work. They've never read any of the work of any of the people who worked off of those people and expanded their work like Mei Wan Ho and too many to name and more than frankly, I can possibly remember. But basically water ends up getting structured in cells by light acting on it. That structured water then can be used by the cell to create energy. This is not the model that the vast majority of people, even in the health and wellness space today are, are working with. They're still working with the old quite frankly, outdated ATP chemical energy model of energy generation. And that's why they don't get particularly impressive results compared to what happens when you start to fully <clears throat> comprehend the paradigm and fix the water and the light and the minerals, mm -hmm. as well as vitamins and amino acids and all the rest of it. So what ends up happening in the cell is that light programs the water, but people don't understand that water networks really depend upon minerals in order to mm. do their work. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, and I don't know if anyone really has elucidated the, the foundational quantum mechanics behind this, but you see it in clinical practice because people will come in and they'll say, I'm saunaing, I get plenty of sunlight, I, <clears throat> I have a good lighting environment, but unfortunately they are not seeing the results or they're not feeling better. And then you look at their hair tissue testing or other mineral markers and you say your nutritional status is a disaster. Your total toxic burden is high. So you have, off, yeah. yeah, you have the right bioenergetic signals, i.e. light coming into your body, mm. but you don't have the minerals necessary in order for that light to be really harnessed by the cell to actually generate energy and create wellness. And and I think a very interesting point to sort of piggyback off of is that with mineral balancing, we can reverse a lot of the consequences of this improper environment that you've been exposed to. Yes. That, and, and and so there are consequences to this when you're when you go through this over time, over a long enough time time cycle, like, you know, decades, this is really what it takes for people to be or to end up in, in a disease state. And so with mineral balancing, I, I, you can go back into the past, into these old patterns that you've been through that are present as a consequence of the accumulation of those poor choices, bad decisions, bad lighting environment, and all of that. Getting the lighting environment is extremely important. And I think the only other system really out there that works with mineral balancing is the quantum biology system. And, and what a lot of those folks are saying, like Gerald Pollack, Dr. Jack Cruz, of course, we can't not mention him. Um, you know, we have to heavily caveat because we just, <laughs> man, do we butt heads on the amount of seafood that is 100%. 100%. Like we, yeah. we just, I have, we have to, I have to say this. Yes, get you people in who are eating huge amounts of seafood and Jack mm -hmm. says that's not a problem. And I have the mercury testing to confirm that he is wrong. Right. And exactly. then I have the cases where they get better when I mitigate the mercury with various things. Mm -hmm. So 
I understand this perspective people have fish is good for you. It's healthy. It's whatever. But I actually, I reviewed a really interesting paper on this the other day and they showed that the risk of death was minimized with a fish intake for men of 105 grams a week. 105 grams a week is nothing. Mm. That is like three and a half ounces. Yeah, that's I need a six or seven or eight ounce serving of salmon for dinner and that's normal. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's a lot that I still, I, mean, I still have so many questions about the fish oil thing and there's so many, so much more to it. A lot of which I think is uh, honestly, I think a lot of why fish consumption is linked to longevity and vitality and why fish oil levels have been lauded as a huge marker for overall wellness. I think it has more to do with the fact that fish are rich in minerals and a lot less to do with the fact that hmm. we need huge quantities of fish oil to be optimal. And I see this in the health and wellness literature all over the place. You know, today I was looking at a post by someone talking about how, you know, omega sixes are so bad, but as we've talked about many times, you know, people just don't appreciate how much uh, toxic metals can accumulate in, uh, you know, vegetable oils, refined seed oils and things like that. And so when people say, oh, you know, you know, it's just, it's just because linoleic acid is terrible. Well, hold on a minute. You know, when you look at the, the, the refining process for oils, how do you know that there's not tons of not only petroleum products, but heavy metals that are also still contaminating these? That's that, that I think is a huge confounder. And Jack talks about a lot of this, the biochemistry studies are done under improper in improper lighting yeah. environments. That's a valid critique. That's a phenomenal critique, actually. And you go, yes, he's on to something. But a lot of the nutritional epidemiology may be confounded by the fact that there are metals in the food more ubiquitously now than ever before. <laughs> Up right now, you're reading it and you're realizing, oh shit, Clark might be right. Oh shit, Dr. Exley is right. Don't be there, Clark. <laughs> <I'm> trying <laughs> to keep our PG-13 rating, okay? Sorry, sorry. I'm just, I get fired up when I see anything by Dr. Exley. Um, you know, yeah, this book is real eye opening for people who might be listening to this later. This is, I'm holding up the book, Imagine You Are on Aluminum, Adam. Hold on. I'm low key disappointed, Clark, that it's not the British spelling and pronunciation, aluminium. Oh, look at this. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like people don't, don't realize, like, for example, a huge proportion of the fish being consumed in the modern world is canned in aluminum. Mm -hmm. somebody asked me that not long ago saying hey dr stillman am i better off not eating aluminum canned fish mm -hmm. or eating it because it's most convenient and shelf stable mm -hmm. i get that uh but actually in this book goes over how there's no way that, that aluminum is not getting out of packaging and into people's food mm -hmm. and it's also all he talks about this as well which is another sort of thing that was subtle and i was like how did i not recognize this mm -hmm. before but you were like that's really true a lot of the machines that are processing things, either cosmetics or foods yeah. or whatever, are aluminum based. They're made with aluminum. So, you know, there's a little bit of aluminum leaching or getting onto these products through processing in that way, right? But to your point about seed oils and, you know, omega sixes and are they bad, are they not? And I, I think generally speaking, yes, there's a lot of good evidence that, that omega sixes or seed oils in general, vegetable oils, are really not great. They are inflammatory, but it's very hard to tease out. Are they inflammatory because of the oil itself or are they inflammatory because hydrogenated fats, as one example, uh, are made with nickel. And so a lot of hydrogenated fats have nickel in them, which is a very inflammatory carcinogenic metal. It's very difficult to tease this out, right? And so, you know, that that's a that's a big confounding factor in the same way that doing all of these biochemistry studies, you know, in a test tube under a blue light environment could confound a lot of biochemistry research. A lot of nutritional mm -hmm. technology could be confounded by the fact that we are surrounded and in an environment that is suffused with metals at a rate that we have never even sort of fully grasped or could can comprehend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I'm yes. going to ask this question on here. This is a good question. So someone mm. is saying, I have green pasture fermented cod liver oil and concentrated butter oil that was recommended yes. from wise traditions for preparing for baby and child care. Mm. Thoughts on supplementation with cod liver oil or refrain from just before we move on to the next topic. It's such a good question. So um, truly, I, I really would like to 
to spend more time talking to some people who've gotten really deep into this literature because I, I really want to know what they what they think. Uh, here's the here's another rub that's really important. How much fat you consume is going to determine how much fat your body can excrete, including toxins. One of the reasons why we are just so enthusiastic about GB3 is that it really, I mean, it moves the needle for so many people. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's basically a bile acid supplement. That's at least 70% of what's in there. And there's, you know, black radish extract and there's pancreatin and that's great. But I'm counting on the bile acids in there to really move the needle for people because yeah. one thing that's very clear from the literature is the more bile acids you have around, the more you're going to be able to excrete toxins, including heavy metals, including rancid fats, including fat soluble toxins. Yeah. There's some fascinating literature out there on how uh, Gulf War syndrome may be subclinical vitamin A toxicity. Mm. And I don't know if you've ever run into this literature, either of you, but it's, it's a fascinating hypothesis that really fits with the way I've seen vitamin A work mm -hmm. in practice. So, you know, for those of you who don't, who don't know, vitamin A is a fat soluble vitamin. Um, it at super low circulating levels, you will end up with lots and lots of problems with infections. But what's interesting about it is that all those patients, generally speaking, are also uh, very severely malnourished. We're yeah. talking about, you mm -hmm. know, kids with protein, calorie malnutrition in third yeah. world countries. And easy. right. And the, the historic teaching is that when you give people vitamin A, you've got say like viral illnesses. And I hesitate even to say that word because I don't want to get smacked by the censorship bots on YouTube. But um, if you give kids like vitamin A, it helps with certain viral um, processes, which is why it's gotten such a reputation of for cod liver oil and, and butter in the integrative health space for being good for people for recovering from colds and flus. But whenever we're giving vitamin A, we're also actually giving fat into the diet. And when you're giving fat into the diet, you're going to maybe increase the amount of fat and fat soluble toxins and whatever that is excreted, right? This is one of my reasons or theories for why the, the carnivore diet can work so well for some people. Mm -hmm. What if they just have a high total body burden of fat, fat soluble toxins and by massively increasing the amount of fat they're taking in, they're able to get rid of that because many of them will describe a very brisk bowel movement tempo after they transition to the diet, to put it mildly, which would coincide then with at least theoretically eliminating all these toxins. But back mm -hmm. to Gulf War syndrome, when, what they hypothesize is that the liver gets overwhelmed with toxins. The ETO cells that, uh, or ITO cells, I don't know. I think it's ITO. They, oh, thank you, Clark. Uh, <laughs> that or vitamin A. Coffee <laughs> talking. <laughs> leak vitamin A, and then you get subclinical vitamin A toxicity, and it's slightly high, high circulating levels. This is why I check vitamin A levels in my lab.